So let's move on, I think, to HER2 positive metastatic, well, HER2 positive breast cancer. And I think that, you know, the questions I think that have been kind of asked in the last couple of uh, months to years with this is what do we do with the triple positive? The HER2 positive, ER positive group of patients in the early stage. And so the first thing, uh, there was a neoadjuvant study that was presented, B52, uh, at San Antonio, and it was a, a, a chemotherapy, it was uh, TCHP, which was docetaxel, carboplatin, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. Uh, and in the ER positive subgroup, they did some sort of either tamoxifen with LHRH agonist or aromatase inhibitor. Um, and so what do you guys think of that trial? Do you want to, I mean, I'll, talk, I'll tell you what the result was, there was no difference in That's PCR. Flat negative, it was kind right? of a negative study. <laughs> flat you negative. know, did that surprise anybody? Well, again, it was an equivalent study. I'll go back to the days of yeah. Karen Ampen <laughs> when, right. when the bone marrow trials came out. They were they equivalent. Said, it wasn't better. trials, they were equivalent, so it wasn't like we were harming women by right. depleting their estrogen levels. But, you know, I think this remains one of the biggest black boxes in breast cancer biology. I mean, the number of lectures I go to on any given month about how ER has crosstalk with the HER2 pathway, and you can almost come up with almost any story. And this is gonna be relevant not only in the metastatic setting, but also in the early stage setting. We saw this from B52, and then we have the Extinet study coming down the, the path, which is the addition of neratinib, really benefiting in the extended HER2 blockade setting, really benefiting the ER positive patients the most. So. Is there some interface? Yes. Do we understand it? I don't think we do. And you can model it in um, oophorectomized mice all day long. That was the basis of B52, which is take out the ovaries, add some lapatinib, add some trastuzumab, and you always see some synergy and anti-tumor effects. The B52 study failed to show us a benefit in that. And I guess the reason I was picking on the equivalence is at least for some women where preservation of ovarian function is important, some of us, us would feel comfortable utilizing an LHRH agonist. And at least what we didn't see was this huge detriment in a PCR rate. They were equivalent. It really had no effect. And that's disappointing, but at the same time not surprising given how little we know about the interaction between ER signaling and HER2 signaling. Is PCR even a, of an endocrine positive disease, is PCR even an endpoint that we should be using, Mark? I mean, you know. It, well, I mean, I think in, in ER positive, HER2 negative, probably not. In, yeah. in triple positives, I think that's an open question. And, and I think the challenge is that triple positive disease is very heterogeneous, probably. And that's what the Pamela study is talking about. Right. Well, right? can you talk, tell us about Pamela? So this is this just single agent HP and, and looking at whether or not PAM50 is predictive of PCR. And in just the group of patients that were truly HER2 enriched in the triple positive subset, those are the ones who appear to benefit from the therapy, whereas those who are not don't. So, and I think, you know, we, over the years, we've expanded our definition of HER2 positivity from the pathology standpoint to avoid missing people who could potentially benefit from anti-HER2 therapy or HER2-directed therapies. But in doing so, we may well have kind of cast the net to include people who aren't going to benefit because their tumors aren't really HER2-driven. Right. And, and in this triple positive subset, you've probably, you know, enriched for folks who are not going to necessarily have right. Well, it was therapy. overall, it's interesting, only about 60%, 57, 60% of the people uh, who were in PAM50, which was a phase two trial of HP in the neoadjuvant setting, I think for six cycles, looking at PCR as an endpoint. And in Pamela, you know, it was interesting that only 60% of the people were HER2 enriched, and they were really the only ones that had a pathologic CR. Right. You know, so, I mean, some people will ask, should we be using PAM50 now? Should we be intrinsic subtyping everybody? Hmm. You know, what do you think? Who are... Walk in the door. Patient walks into a HER2 yeah. positive tumor, triple positive. Should you intrinsically subtype so it? So in the U.S., I think, again, one of the problems with expanding what defines HER2 positive right. is that we are now obligated, yeah. unfortunately, and I see one patient a week with a node negative ER positive breast cancer. I saw one yesterday, grade one. But HER2 ratio 2.1, 2 plus equivocal on IHC, and so the discussion has to be the standard of care is to utilize trastuzumab for the treatment of your early stage breast cancer. So until we um, have a real validation study, because I think Pamela was very, in, and it's what we all kind of see. We have the patients that are ER positive, HER2 positive. You either give them TCHP or whatever your favorite neoadjuvant, and that thing melts away. And then there's the other patient 
who you restain the residual tumor, and guess what? The HER2 fish comes back negative, and you're stuck giving them an anthracycline because really they're more either triple negative in that case. And um, so I thought Pamela kind of mirrored what we we're seeing in the clinic anyway. So let me bring, I mean, I hate to bring this in. What about Mamaprint, the 70 gene assay? <laughs> I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna come back to this. I'm focusing on it, and I'm focusing on it for this reason. So in that study, I think there were five or 600 patients who were HER2 positive, yeah. all right? And most of them were ER positive as mm -hmm. well, the triple positive. 23% of those were low genomic risk which is similar to the retrospective studies they've done with uh, the 70 gene assay in the past. So those are the people that you wouldn't give chemo to, right? Would you give chemo to someone like that who comes in that door with a grade one, one, one and a half centimeter T1C tumor? That's HER2 positive. That's HER2 positive. What yes, I would. Even if they're low genomic right, risk? Yeah. yeah, I follow the ASCO guidelines yeah. on this subject, But if they're, low, if they're low genomic risk, you still would do that? At yes, the risk of over-treating them? Yes, I would. You would? Okay. Yeah, because I don't think we have a differentiating assay at this point. So the, the mean, mammoprint isn't differentiating and that, assay. And to be quite honest, there's doctors out there that are getting sued because they did not offer trastuzumab for a stage early, like a T1C in zero, and the cancer comes back. Mm -hmm. And those patients, you just don't know. So um, very practically, yes, I would. And I certainly don't think, I mean, given what we talked about with the limitations of the predictive ability of the assay for chemotherapy benefit, I mean, trying to but hone down. But there are multiple, they're, they, admittedly, there's a few that are retrospective. There's a rec couple retrospective trials that do the same thing. And now you have a prospective trial, you've got three independent studies. You know, I don't know. I mean, I I'm not going to do it for someone with a lot of nodes, but if someone comes no, in with a, the patient Kim talked about. But that's about. the patients that were enrolled on the, on the, weekly paclitaxel TRAS study, right? They did yeah. extremely well. Who knows if they did well because they got TRAS or because they were, you know, less than three centimeters. 67% ER of those positive. pages were triple positive. By no, I yeah. know. No, I mean, so we, we don't know. We treated a bunch of them. I mean, I, I think many of us in our heart of hearts think you're probably right, but I mean, given the, the data that Correct. as it exists Physicians right are now. Right? We're a conservative bunch, I agree. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that you, when you have a success, it's hard to back away. Right, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. And especially if you have an agent like trastuzumab, which has relatively low toxicity, I think right. you just need to have a very strong reason not to give it. And 12 so, weeks of taxol and trastuzumab is really pretty well tolerated. It is, I agree, just hair loss, that's about it.